Well, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Terrence Hughes. Uh, Terry is being sponsored by the Storer Endowment series in major issues in modern biology. Uh, Terry got his undergraduate degree at Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, he got his master's and PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, working with Jeremy Jackson, and uh, then did a postdoc with Joe Connell down at uh, UCSB in the early 1980s. And currently, he's professor at James Cook University in Townsville, Australia, uh, and he's been there in that position since 2000. Terry's a coral reef biologist, and his interest in coral reefs are rather broad. They comprise studies of biodiversity, population dynamics, genetics, and even life histories, and particularly of coral species. Uh, more recently, he's been focusing on the influences of climate change and other human impacts on coral reefs. And some of his re recent work has involved multidisciplinary uh, collaborations with social scientists. So he's getting in the policy end of things to develop strategies for managing reef systems. My colleague and I, Ron Carlson, had the great privilege of collaborating with Terry on a biodiversity study in the Pacific uh, starting about in 2000. Uh, and we were, for this study, we had to actually do sampling across a transect across the Pacific Ocean. And uh, Terry, Terry led the project and led the, um, led the uh, sampling. And, not being a coral taxonomist, I didn't feel very useful in that aspect of the project, but we had uh, the ability to, to visit some really wonderful places in the Pacific at the time. And uh, I really uh, learned to love uh, coral reef systems from my experience there. Now, Terry's won many awards. I don't want to list them all, but I will mention that he is a member of the Australian Academy of Sciences. He's also an ARC, that's Australian Research Council, uh, Federation Fellow, and most recently he's won the Darwin Medal from the International Society for Reef Studies. The title of his talk today is As You See. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks very much everyone. Um, as you can see I'm wired up here like a Christmas tree. Um, I've got one microphone for the recording and another one so he can hear me. Um, I have to apologize, um, firstly, for the strange accent. Uh, because I grew up in Ireland, spent 12 years in this country, and now live down under, um, I've got a funny twang to my voice. I've also got a cold, so um, <coughs> hopefully you can hear me and understand me. If you can't, please wave at me or something, and I'll, I'll uh, try and turn up the volume or something. Um, so I've been studying coral reefs for um, uh, quite a few uh, years now. So uh, coral reefs, as you know, are getting a, a lot of bad press recently. And uh, I'd like to illustrate that with, very briefly with an, uh, an anecdote just to kick off with. Um, I was at a conference in Stockholm earlier this year on resilience, which is a very broad concept that I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. And there were lots of people there from many disciplines, and I was one of only a handful of ecologists. And a perfect stranger during coffee break asked me what I did for a living. And so I proudly puffed out my chest and claimed that I was a, a coral reef ecologist. And she looked at me and said, oh, that must be horrible. <laughs> and uh, that, that quite floored me, because usually people say things like, ooh, that's kind of neat. I bet you dive in Tahiti or which is all true. Um, <laughs> but it, it drove home to me that I, as, a, as a community of, of researchers, uh, the coral reef scientists, I think, have been very good in communicating to the general public um, that coral reefs are in trouble. Um, the problem is that message is often somewhat exaggerated to become coral reefs are absolutely, I can't say that word in public, um, doomed, um, which begs the question, are they really doomed? I don't believe they are. So I'm going to try and put um, what may be viewed by some of you as a more optimistic spin on the future of coral reefs today. OK. Um, so just a little bit of a roadmap of where I'm going to take you. I'm going to start out by talking about uh, phase shifts. They're sometimes called regime shifts. And this concept um, called resilience uh, of reefs. I'm going to talk about two 
case studies that have very different social and economic settings. So if, if you're interested in the translation of coral reef science into coral reef management and governance, then the, the social and economic uh, settings uh, of various reefs around the world is absolutely uh, critical. I started out in preparing this talk with four case studies, but I realized that 150 slides in 55 minutes or so wasn't really going to work. So we're down to two. Um, I'll talk about Jamaica and uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And then if we've got some time, I'll, uh, I'll talk about some of the lessons from those case studies and some potential recommendations for the future. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This slide is my why are coral reefs important slide. So it, it shows the, the geographic distribution uh, of reefs, the red splotches around the world between the, uh, the northern and, and southern tropics straddling the equator here. Um, coral reefs are absolutely critical, critical for the ecosystem goods and services that they provide to many millions of people, um, particularly in developing countries. And I just want to point out Australia's position here. Um, there are very few developed wealthy countries with significant amounts of coral reefs. The United States has stewardship of just over 1% of the world's coral reefs. Australia has possession of about 12% of the world's coral reefs, which means it's ranked fourth in the world um, in terms of uh, square kilometers of reef per uh, country. So overwhelmingly, the coral reef crisis is a crisis of uh, developing countries. And as you know, um, there's some very rubbery figures around that say that roughly a third of the world's coral reefs are already severely degraded to the extent that they will probably never recover. They've been mined or they're covered in layers of sediment. Um, another 30% are locally threatened by particularly overfishing and, uh, and by uh, runoff from land following land clearing and urban development. The word locally here is important because if we take the 30% of already degraded reefs away from the total 100%, the rest are all threatened by climate change because climate change is something a reef can't hide from. So even the most remote, otherwise uh, undamaged reefs are threatened by uh, accelerating climate change. Can I just do a sound check here? Can people hear me okay? All right. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> all right, let me briefly describe this. Um, concept of resilience. It was, uh, dates back to a classic paper by Buzz Holling, published in uh, 1975, but the concept has really taken on uh, a life of its own, really only in the last um, five years, and particularly the coral reef community, both the science community and the NGO community, have really latched onto that uh, concept, some of which is my fault, and, and sometimes I ask myself, what have I done? Um, anyway, I'll come back to that issue. It can be defined as the capacity of a system to absorb disturbances without fundamentally flipping into something completely different. And I'll show you some examples uh, in a moment. That system can be an ecological one, and I'll mainly today talk about ecological resilience. But social scientists also worry about flips. The French Revolution was a flip. Um, economists worry about flips, the Wall Street crash. Um, was a flip, and increasingly we're seeing an emerging multidisciplinary research area that focuses on so-called linked social ecological systems. And part of that uh, new research initiative is driven by an organization called the Resilience Alliance, um, which I'm a member of. I, I was invited to join it um, in 2003. It's basically an interdisciplinary international think tank that's made up of um, 17 uh, institutions um, that are focusing on what could be broadly called complex adaptive systems. So many of us are ecologists interested in the sort of collapses of ecosystems that I'll describe in a moment, but others are anthropologists interested in the collapse of societies. There's a couple of complex system mathematicians. Um, there's lots of social scientists who are interested in governance structures and institutional arrangements for building uh, resilience. And so we share an interest in threshold dynamics, alternative states or flips, and also very expensive red wines. Um, and we've published a lot of papers together over the last um, five years. 
Somebody uh, today, one, one of the uh, graduate students uh, who I met this morning, asked me whether um, un alternate states could, be, could both be resilient. And that was, uh, I thought, a very uh, insightful question. So this last point here points out that, that different configurations of an ecosystem or an economy or whatever, or whatever can be de de deemed by societal consensus to be desirable or undesirable. And so we might seek to build or bolster the resilience of the desirable state. But an equally uh, valid approach to management is to erode the undesirable state. In the coral reef literature, there's a lot of talk very recently about building the resilience of reefs, particularly to climate change. By that, people mean building the resilience of the coral-dominated system. But an equally valid approach is to erode or undermine the resilience of the less desirable um, states, such as algal blooms, which can replace um, coral reefs. I'm fully aware that desirable and undesirable are very loaded terms, and sometimes there may not be a consensus about which of two alternatives are less desirable, and that brings up all sorts of issues about um, equity and empowerment and so on. Just some examples then of uh, ecological flips. I'm going to show you uh, a couple. This is the one I'll spend most of my time talking about today. Um, that's a picture there that I took in 1979. <coughs> I tell people I was only three years old then. Um, I was actually an honours student. Um, and these are reefs, that's, that's the Jamaican four reef in the Caribbean. And I just want to point out the two species of corals that are very dominant there. That's the Elkhorn coral, Acropora palmata. And this is the Staghorn coral, Acropora cervicornis. And in Jamaica, until the early 1980s, those two species were very dominant. About 80% of the coral cover, down to a depth of 20 meters, was attributable to just those two species. The classical zonation studies of Caribbean reefs, which were done in the late 1950s and through the 60s, described the Acropora palmata zone and the Acropora cervicornis zone. You could swim for kilometers in the depth range of those two species and it would be 80% covered by both of them. Today, those two species are listed on the EPA endangered species list. So they've undergone a huge crash all around the Caribbean um, through a variety of, of mechanisms, which I can describe uh, later, but I haven't got much time to go into it now. And instead, many reefs in the Caribbean look like this. So this is a mat of green algae. There's very low coral cover. There's some weedy corals here that can make a life uh, in between these dense thickets uh, of algae. Um, I want to make one other point with this picture. A, a critical issue for regime shifts and their resilience is the extent to which you get positive feedbacks that lock them in. So if we consider the coral-dominated state, here we've got a very high coral cover, which means there's lots of baby corals being produced. Um, the substrate here doesn't have much macroalgae. It's a suitable substrate for settlement. I'll go into that I issue in a moment. Um, so this, this system is basically self-reinforcing, and it maintains itself as a highly resilient system. But the same thing happens over here. Because of that thick algal bloom, which is typically about 10 centimeters, 4 inches, or even 6 inches in depth, no coral larvae can permeate that that barrier to settle onto the substrate. And even if they did, they'd be shaded and smothered by that thick algal bloom. The algae is also a much more um, flattened substrate. The three-dimensionality of the coral structure has gone. And that's an impediment to settlement by reef fish, including herbivorous fish that could potentially um, mop up this algae. So this is very much uh, a reinforcing uh, set of feedbacks. And another potential feedback that people have speculated about is that mature algal stands like this are mechanically and chemically defended, and so that they've escaped uh, from herbivory because of their maturity and locking them in semi-permanently. In Jamaica, this flip occurred in the early 1980s. And so for 25 years or so, we had this permanent flip. So it, too, has um, a high resilience, just as the coral-dominated system did. And one final point. This picture has very high coral cover, but there are no fish um, in this picture. And most of us studying the reefs of uh, Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean uh, didn't really notice that. Um, 
the usual metric of the health of a coral reef is coral cover. And it's a terrible metric by which to monitor the resilience of reefs. It tells us uh, something about ecosystem state, but it doesn't tell us about resilience. So this appeared to be a very healthy reef, but in fact, it was a biological time bomb waiting to explode. Some other examples of flips in pelagic systems we've seen worldwide, uh, the collapse of pelagic fisheries and the simpli simplification of food webs leading to blooms of plankton, including jellyfish. Um, another familiar example to temperate marine biologists is the collapse of kelp beds, which like corals provide a three-dimensional habitat with lots of species associated with them. Instead, we get this very impoverished uh, configuration, a very different ecosystem, which is dominated by crustose coralline algae and sea urchins. These are called urchin barrens. And they too are very persistent, except where the urchins are, uh, become an emergent fishery for the uni trade in Japan. And, and those boom and bust fisheries typically result in a reversal back to uh, a kelp bed. Okay, I want to make a few points um, about the theory of uh, resilience. I'll, I'll be pretty brief. So I've plotted here ecosystem state on the y-axis with two alternative configurations, a coral-dominated state versus macroalgae, uh, etc. The etc. here refers to the observation that the alternative state for coral reefs is not just macroalgal blooms. There can be other alternative states, and I'll describe those uh, in the next slide. And this axis is not time, it's the drivers that drive this transition from coral dominance to an alternative, I'll call it a degraded state. And the three main drivers, sorry, I'm trapped by wires, globally for coral reefs, with many other additional minor uh, drivers, are overfishing, nutrients typically from runoff from land, and increasingly climate change. Now corals, because they're a resilient ecosystem, can absorb a lot of these stressors or drivers, but only to a certain st stage when they reach a critical tipping point or a, or a threshold, and then they crash and we move into a, a different configuration. That's the dynamic that many of us have observed and studied on coral reefs around the world. So we know a fair bit, and there's lots of papers that make pretty dreary reading about how my reef that I've studied for 20 years is now dead, okay? What we know much less about is about the reverse trajectory. And that's the trajectory that I want to focus on in the slide after next. But first, I just want to make the point about it not just being about algae. So this is a graphic that comes from a paper my colleagues and I published uh, a couple of years back where we made the point that there are multiple drivers with multiple outcomes. So this is uh, a schematic showing the likely uh, transitions that occur with varying degrees of fishing pressure and varying degrees of nutrients. Typically on reefs these co-vary, so it's, uh, it's very hard to imagine a heavily overfished reef that isn't also polluted because they tend to go up. The classic case of a reef flipping due to added nutrients is Kanihoe Bay in, in Hawaii, which uh, some of you may have read about. Uh, that occurred in the 1970s when a sewage pipe caused this landlocked uh, bay in Hawaii to uh, eutrophy, and the patch reefs dominated by corals in there became instead dominated by sponges and filter feeding um, uh, mollusks, uh, um, what were they, various clams. Um, so that was a transition to a heterotrophic um, assemblage. Anyway, the only point I want to make with, with that is that healthy reefs can absorb a certain amount of these stressors or drivers before flipping, and then they can flip into various different things depending on the relative strength of those two drivers. So going back to our graph, I've made it a little bit more complicated here by putting a backward trajectory in there. Now, I have to stress that this is mostly theoretical because we have very few observations of a backward trajectory in coral reefs. The drivers are usually constant, chronic, building things. That it's like a pulse experiment where we don't take our finger off the button. Kanioe Bay was the exception because the sewage that caused the initial flip, the, the sewage was diverted, which is a euphemism for they made the pipe longer. 
and instead of going into the bay, um, the, it went offshore, the bay became clearer, and the corals came back and replaced the, uh, the mollusks and sponges that had flourished in high nutrient environment. But there are very few cases like that in the coral reef literature. I can think of only four, and I'll describe the other three um, later on uh, in the talk. So in theory, because of the feedbacks that I described, we would anticipate that the backward trajectory would not simply be a mirror image of the downward one. And we know from lakes that have eutrophied, where people have managed the lakes and got them to flip back, that we have to reduce, in the case of lakes, the, the phosphate and nitrate load much, to much lower levels than the ones that initially caused the threshold collapse in order to induce a backwards flip. So as I said in my introduction, most people focus on the resilience of the coral dominant state and how we can maintain it and avoid going over this threshold. But an equally valid management objective is to understand this backward trajectory and can we nudge reefs that are currently close to this threshold back so that they flip back into um, a more healthy configuration. Okay, now this graph isn't quite uh, complete because there are other dynamics that we need to consider. So sometimes people refer to these as the slow chronic drivers. The white arrows here are more acute events. These are the day-to-day -day background things that can occur to reefs like um, a cyclone or hurricane, or increasingly we're dealing also with bleaching events or outbreaks of disease. So the idea here is that when the reef is uh, in this configuration, it's a, a long way from a threshold that would push it into an alternative state. It can absorb a huge amount of disturbance and nonetheless recover. And so that's the normal state. Reefs have evolved, for instance, to cope with recurrent hurricanes or cyclones. Depending on the geographic region in question, every 10 or 30 years, they get pretty, pretty badly banged up by a cyclone. But they've done that for millions of years, and they can recover. So, a healthy coral reef system that's not polluted, not overfished, can normally re re rebound. That's part of their natural dynamics. But as these stressors accumulate, it takes less and less of a disturbance to push it over that dotted line. And you may be familiar with another set of terminology about multiple basins of attraction. So that dotted line basically is a cusp that separates the coral-dominated state from the macroalgal-dominated -alg state. Um, so increasingly we're seeing um, ecological surprises where reefs have, unbeknownst to us, get, got closer and closer to these thresholds and a disturbance which beforehand they had routinely dealt with tips them over this tipping point and they make this transition to um, a degraded state. Okay, so that's basically in a nutshell um, the theory of resilience and uh, I apologize for dragging you through it. but. Many people have adapted this resilience concept, particularly in the coral reef uh, ecology and management uh, arena, with, I think it's fair to say, only a partial understanding of this concept. So the critical things are alternate regimes or configurations, threshold behavior, and two or more alternate sets of feedbacks. Those are the, the critical features of uh, resilience. At the, uh, the coral reef meeting, which is about two and a half thousand people that, that uh, Howard mentioned in his introduction, there was a two-day session on resilience of corals to bleaching, by which the conveners meant if the bleach coral died, it wasn't resilient, and if it survived, it did. Well, that's a perfectly normal use of the English word resilience, but it's not this concept, and, and that's my point. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. All right, I want to go on now to uh, deal uh, with these two case studies. I'll deal more briefly uh, with Jamaica. Uh, that's the same uh, photograph um, that I showed you before. And I made the point earlier that there are no fish in this picture. And normally on coral reefs, fish play uh, a critical ecological role in that many of them are herbivores. And these are the scraping marks of a parrotfish. Um, groups of fish like parrotfish and surgeonfish and also rabbitfish, they're the three main families of uh, reef fish that control the abundance of macroalgae. Increasingly around the world, we're seeing uh, fishing down the food chain effect where large predatory fish have, in many cases, been long depleted. Uh, 
and increasingly coral reef fisheries in developing countries are based on these herbivorous fish. So we're also seeing in places like Jamaica severe depletion of herbivorous fish uh, stocks. Um, and even at the time when I began studying uh, Jamaican coral reefs in the late 1970s, only about 10% of the original biomass of herbivorous fish was still present on the reefs at that time. Now, none of us really paid much attention to that because there wasn't much macroalgae, and the reason for that is because of this creature. And this isn't a great photograph, I'm sorry. This is Diadema antelarum, um, the scientific name for diadema, sorry, the, the common name for diadema is really imaginative. It's called the long-spined black sea urchin. And um, probably because of overfishing of its predators and overfishing of its fish competitors, the density of diadema in the late 70s and early 80s was incredibly high. It averaged more than 10 per square meter on shallow reefs. The highest published mean abundance of diadema from Jamaica is 77 per square meter. Above about three per square meter, if you do the measurements of the bioerosion of this species and compare that to the accretion capacity of a reef, through the growth of corals and crustose coralline algae mainly, you, you find, and there's some published literature on this, that these reefs were actually losing more carbonate than they were capable of accreting at these densities of diadema. So it seems pretty clear to me that these were unnaturally high densities that made this species uh, particularly prone to uh, an outbreak of disease if that were ever to occur. So just to summarize, the herbivorous fish had been decimated. This was the last remaining uh, herbivore on the reef. It was super abundant, and it did a splendid job, in fact, too good a job, of keeping the reef clean of macroalgae because it was also boring into the reef and uh, eroding it. In 1983, and I don't have time to go through the details of it, diadema suffered a 99% mortality throughout its geographic range throughout the Caribbean. And as it turns out, I saw um, some sick urchins that looked like this while I was uh, snorkeling uh, for leisure one weekend at the western tip of the island of Jamaica. And we'd heard rumors about an epidemic of this species in Panama a couple of months earlier. So I went to my regular study site, which is about 60 kilometers further along the coast, and I set up some photo belt transects and recorded the number of diadema in those belt transects and I did it on a daily basis while this disease came along the coast at a rate of 20 kilometers a day. So three or four days later it appeared and those photo quadrats enclosed about 240 diadema and they went from symptom free to dead in 10 days. So it was an absolutely huge phenomenon. The densities that were occurring at those days meant that each kilometer of coastline in Jamaica had about one million diadema, and 99% of them died in 10 days at any one site. So it was an absolutely huge uh, event for those of us who are ancient enough to have uh, witnessed it. Um, so that's what the reef looked like in 1983. Three years earlier, there'd been a cyclone, sorry, wrong hemisphere, a hurricane, Hurricane Allen, um, hurricane Allen is a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, hurricanes, as you know, are classified from 1 through 5. 1 is a lot of rain, but not too much to worry about. 5 is, oh my God, we're all going to die. And so it was a, a, a major event. It removed most of the Acropora palmata and Acropora cervicornis that I showed you earlier, those two branching species. So this is dead rubble of cervicornis that's been cemented into place by these purple splotches, which are crustose corallines. There's no macroalgae in this picture. This is the very high density of diadema. They're doing a great job keeping the reef clean of macroalgae. And if you look carefully enough, you can see some juvenile corals that were settling in quite high numbers onto the bare space kept bare by diadema in the three year period since that hurricane occurred. And then the urchins died. And so within a period of days, the reef started to go green. It began with blue-green algal mats, and it took about five years to run its course. 
and it went through a successional sequence that typically resulted in a, a large fleshy dominant that differed at different depths. So there's a sargassum zone, there's a turbinaria zone, uh, this is dictyota. Um, and so this is what the reef uh, looked like within three to five years after the die-off of diadema, and it still looks like that today in most places. As a result of this, low-lying corals and the juvenile corals that had settled in the three-year window after Hurricane Allen were smothered, and, uh, and there was been no replacement of these adult corals that survived the hurricane. Um, but there's been a gradual decline in coral cover. So before the die-off and before the hurricane, the average coral cover at my study sites was 77 per square meter. After Hurricane Allen, that was reduced to about 20%, depending on the, on the depth, and it's declined every year since then, and, and today it's about 3%. So that's basically uh, the Jamaican uh, story. Um, sorry, I've moved to that too quickly. Um, in the more recent literature, there's been some um, speculation and indeed a couple of papers that claim that the diadema have recovered. And certainly there is a growth trajectory of the diadema population. It's now been 25 years since the 1983 die-off. And um, I did a, basically a meta-analysis that, that looked at the validity of the claims that diadema was coming back. Um, so this is a graph of density of diadema. The blue bars are the pre-die-off literature, uh, some of which is my own papers. Uh, plotted against depth, and the orange bars are the most uh, recent records. And this, it's actually a very rich data set. There's more than 3,000 uh, records, and the majority of those are for after 1983. But most of the post-1983 records are, in fact, zeros. So the recovery to date has, in fact, been very modest. So people today see an average of about one diademer per square meter. They haven't seen them for 20 years, and they write papers about the diademer are back, they've recovered. But if you actually look at the older literature and do that comparison, the, die back, sorry, the comeback so far has been incredibly modest, but it does seem to be um, accelerating. Um, it's also truncated by depth. So even in relatively deep water before the die-off, there were significant numbers of diadema below depths of, of 15 meters. Today, they're almost all shallower than 10 meters. In fact, most of them are shallower than about uh, three meters. The good news is where they've come back, even at these reduced densities, they're sufficient to reduce the macroalgal cover almost to zero. And so we're starting to see a recovery in shallow water um, where the diadema, where the diadema, I'm sorry, have, have come back. Um, and maybe it's time to put some bored tourists to work um, and spread these diadema down to, uh, to some, uh, some deeper reefs. But the, this is another example, following on from the Kanihoe Bay example, of where reversibility um, does seem to be uh, a possibility. Okay, so just to summarize all of that up, it's a place with low species... Uh, Redundancy within functional groups, sorry, I forgot to mention that. There, I showed you the only two acroporas in the Caribbean. So there's only one tabular-like acropora in the Caribbean, that's palmata. There's only one staghorn coral, acropora cervicornis. That's much lower uh, diversity than in the Pacific, which I'll get to in a moment. Because of overfishing of herbivorous fish, there was only one remaining functional herbivore, which is still not quite abundant enough. Um, and so the megafauna has long since gone, so turtles and sharks and marine mammals, uh, alligators and so on are, are ecologically extinct in places like Jamaica. The reefs are heavily overfished today. The phase shift to algae occurred in Jamaica in the early 1980s. And from my perspective at least, um, we're now looking at new stressors, climate change and disease, that are affecting remnant corals after the collapse occurred. There's a lot of debate about what caused the Caribbean corals to collapse. It's a complex story because it depends on where you're talking about. But in Jamaica, these new things are superimposed on um, an earlier history of, of decline. And the final point here is that marine parks in Jamaica, as in many developing countries, are, uh, are not effective. I'll come back to that 
policy issue later in the talk. Okay, that's all I've time to say about Jamaica, and I need to speed up a bit and move on to the Barrier Reef. Um, so how does the Bar Great Barrier Reef uh, compare the Great Barrier Reef tourism organizations like to project it as this pristine ecosystem where there's still lots of turtles and sharks and dugongs. And yes, you can see those creatures without too much effort, uh, but their trajectory of abundance is, is nothing to uh, be particularly um, confident of. Uh, we know from coral banding studies that runoff into the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon from land increased dramatically in the middle of the 1800s when several million cattle and a couple of million sheep uh, arrived. Um, that work is based on coral banding studies where you take a core through a hemispherical coral which has bands in it like a tree ring and you can count the bands backwards and locate the one that grew between 1850 and 1851 and you can look at the geochemistry of that band. And at about that time, there's a big increase in the amount of terrestrial material, about a five-fold increase in sediment inflow uh, into the reef due to the changed agricultural use. There are also some um, very early uh, colonial uh, fisheries. Uh, I have to explain that in Australia, early colonial is incredibly recently compared to early colonial in, say, uh, the, the east coast of the United States. So it's actually very well um, documented. People talk about herds of dugong that look like herds of buffalo um, in the 1860s, 1870s. So all of these creatures are much less prevalent today than they were when Europeans arrived. So in the 1950s and 60s, about six million crocodiles were shot across the northern half of Australia. Dugongs have certainly declined in the last 200 years. We have very strong data for the last 30 years where there's been a 97% decline of dugongs on the lower two-thirds of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, pearl oysters were mined almost to extinction uh, in the 1800s for their shells uh, all along the Great Barrier Reef. Sea cucumbers were the first export fishery before the Europeans arrived, about 6,000 Indonesians came every summer and they took away dried sea cucumbers for a market in China. So all of these fisheries were export fisheries. Sharks have declined by 95%, mostly in the last 20 years. Loggerhead turtles have declined by 75% in the last 25 years. I'll talk about reef fishes in a minute. The point I want to make is that the Great Barrier Reef is in relatively great shape compared to most coral reefs around the world, but it is a significantly altered system, and it has been for a century. And this is just an example of some of the historical data that we've, uh, we've accumulated. This is data that shows the mean number of sharks caught in shark nets. It's from a paper published quite a while ago. In the early 1960s, the government of Queensland set up shark nets to protect people, because we're part of the food web as well, from sharks. And as part of that uh, endeavor, they required the people tending the net to record what they caught in them. So it's actually about a 30-year record that of, of bycatch in these nets. And this is the number of, of coastal sharks. And if you accept the premise that the shark nets are reasonably good sampling devices, then this would indicate a three or four-fold decline in the abundance of nearshore sharks. This is things like bronze whalers and bull sharks that occasionally eat people um, along the East Coast. A shark net was put up off Townsville, where I live, uh, also in 1962. And in the first year, it caught 69 dugong. In the second year, it caught 16. And in the third year, it caught one. And then it never caught any again. So they had quite a significant impact on the dugong population. Okay, um, just a little bit of data uh, about fish, and this isn't my data, this is my colleague Gary Russ. Gary has done some uh, interesting work comparing the biomass of fish inside areas of the Great Barrier Reef where fishing is allowed, the fishing zones and the no-take zones, to look at the efficacy of these no-take areas in, in terms of protecting fish. Fishing pressure on the Barrier Reef is modest compared to most places and unusually because Australia is a, a wealthy country, 
the take by recreational fishers is actually greater for some species than the commercial take, and there isn't the equivalent of a subsistence or artisanal fishing pressure the way there is in places like Jamaica. So Gary's work typically shows about a fourfold, but up to a sixfold difference in the biomass of, this is Plectropomus, the coral trout, it's a grouper, inside uh, no-take areas compared to uh, adjoining uh, fished areas. And this work was quite influential in convincing the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, which is the main agency in charge of the Barrier Reef, to expand uh, its system of, of no-take areas. So gradually over time, over the last 20 years, uh, there's a very good communication between scientists and that agency. The agency became aware that the Great Barrier Reef wasn't the pristine system that we all thought it was 20 years ago and that the tr downward trajectories were, were, uh, were pretty evident. Um, Gary's work also looked at the uh, impact of these differ differences in predatory fish on the trophic structure of fish reefs versus unfished reefs. And very briefly, here's one of his studies. So in the fish reefs, as you'd expect, where there's uh, not too many of these predatory groupers, you get a lot more pomocentrids compared to the adjoining no-take areas where there's a lot more predators. So that, that's the reverse of the graph um, that I that I just showed you. Um, another issue for the Great Barrier Reef is runoff uh, from land, and I, I just want to show that to you anecdotally with, with two photographs. This is a historical photograph taken in 1890, and this is an Acropora-dominated coral reef on the beach. This is mainland Australia, and when I first saw that picture a couple of years ago, I just about fell off my chair because that to me is a so-called mid-shelf assemblage. It's the sort of corals that I study today 20 kilometers offshore. And there are very few places on the mainland that even approach the coral cover or the species assemblage. You can, if you know what you're looking at, you can identify these things to the species level in many cases. So that, that assemblage very rarely occurs today. So for the hell of it, we went looking for these places. So that mountain range there is our landmark, and that's what it looks like today. So there's the mountain range again, and these are in fact dead corals, and they're covered now by sediment and, and algae. You can collect these corals, take them back and age them, and many of them died between 50 and 100 years ago, and the smoking gun here is, is runoff of sediment, but it may also be uh, fishing pressure as well. All right, and another issue for reefs in general, including uh, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, is climate change. Now, if I want to impress a politician about how important and how big a threat climate change is, I'll show him or her a picture that looks like this, because the seascape here is 100% leached. But that's actually a monospecific stand. It's a single clone of a branching acropora that are among the more susceptible species. So a more typical picture on reefs looks like this. And this isn't the Barrier Reef, this is actually French Polynesia. And that's Howard Cornell. Um, <coughs> I put it into embarrassing. Um, that's a more typical picture because it looks more like a checkerboard with white squares and black squares. And if you look at this, the white squares are tabular acropores and the black unbleached ones are mainly brooding poscillopora. So a, a critical uh, issue for reefs is that coral bleaching is actually very selective. So you hear a lot about reefs bleaching and reefs being destroyed. Reefs aren't bleached. Susceptible genotypes of susceptible coral species are bleached. So it's, it's a bit more subtle than that. And if you throw a, a transect down, and I do this reflexively, on a reef like that and measure the proportion of species A, B, C, D, E, and so on, I've spared you the Latin names that are bleached, it ranges from 100% to zero. So these are the losers in terms of climate change. These are the smaller losers. And there are other species that are actually increasing in abundance due to climate change. And there's two components of that. One is differential mortality, or differential bleaching, which often leads to mortality. Sometimes bleach corals can recover. And the other side of it is differential recovery. So when a bleaching event occurs, Providing the reef doesn't flip, 
into something else. And pr so providing the corals come back, you often get a subset of species that are the early colonizers that are re recovering. So this is a picture from the Great Barrier Reef. This is a dead massive coral of parietes. That's a little bit of it there that survived. So that's one of those big, smooth bombies that you may have seen pictures of. And these are four teenage corals. They're about five or six years old that have uh, recolonized uh, that reef. So for coral reefs, climate change isn't some distant threat that might or might not come to pass. Um, climate change has been measured now on coral reefs in terms of regional scale, unprecedented bleaching events since the mid-1980s. And some reefs that are in the wrong place geographically that are particularly prone to El Nino events, places like the Caribbean, the East Pacific, and French Polynesia, many of those reefs have bleached up to eight times since the mid-1980s. And the ones that haven't flipped, in some cases, have very high coral cover today, as high as they ever did. But the species composition is dramatically altered from the earlier studies that were done uh, in the 80s and, and beforehand. Okay, I want to move on now and describe uh, an experiment we did <coughs> um, on the Great Barrier Reef that, where I was interested in this issue of resilience and uh, what it means for the management of coral reefs. So the question I asked was, what are the consequences of the loss of big fish from reefs? And, and in particular, when a bleaching event occurs, does the presence or absence of large fish make a difference in terms of the resilience of that reef, in terms of its capacity to bounce back? So I set up this experiment. Now, most marine ecologists, this is designed to make everyone envious. When they have cages, they have these little things that they can swim around with. These are my cages, and they're huge. They're um, five meters tall, and they're five by five meters uh, in dimension. And there's uh, three treatments here. Four of them are um, fully meshed to keep out all the fish. Uh, four of them are partially meshed as controls for water flow and um, what else? Light. Um, and there's four plots that you can't see because they don't have any structures. That's a door. The door's two meters tall. And these things, the reason I made them so tall is that I wanted the tops to stick out of water at high tide, and the tidal range here is four and a half meters. So at high tide, the water comes up to here. So um, that's what they look like at high tide. And so hence the doors. At high tide, you can zoom up to them in the boat, tie the boat on there, and jump in. But if you stay there too long, getting out could be <laughs> problematic. Um, so we put in the cage. Now I want to show you two little movie clips, and I have to speed up here a bit. This is the partial cage control part of the experiment. I just want to show you the sort of densities of parrotfish that we have in Australia where there's no fishery um, for these species. Was that clear enough? Do you want to run it again? Um, anyway, lots of parrotfish. The bigger ones there would have been about this big. And there were also some uh, schools of surgeon fish there. And that, which is out of focus because the movie has stopped, is a juvenile coral which is settled onto the bare substrate. And the reason the substrate doesn't have macroalgae is because as soon as they pop the head above the substrate, one of those herbivorous fish will eat it. Okay, this other movie clip starts just outside a fully meshed cage, and I've opened the door so I can push it open further with the camera. And this is what happened after three and a bit years. So we um, experimentally induced a phase shift from coral-dominated system that was recovering after a bleaching event to this macroalgal-dominated alternative. This is sargassum, and it's about three meters long. The wet weight of it, the wet weight of it was um, eight kilograms per square meter. The poor corals that survived the bleaching event are down here in the substrate, and they're, uh, they're very heavily uh, shaded. Um, this is my backup slide in case those movies didn't run, but um, this is the kelp, sorry, the sargassum um, inside. This experiment was, was done on the reef crest, which is the zone of the reef where the intensity of herbivory is maximum. There's, there's just scrape marks everywhere, very high biomass of, of roving uh, herbivorous fish, 
And any time a macroalgae pokes a filament above the substrate, it gets scraped. So I've never seen sargassum like this uh, on, a, on a reef crest. And that's the mesh in the background. And outside, there's some very hungry, jealous-looking parrotfish <laughs> looking inside. OK. Um, it cost $100,000 to build those cages and maintain them for three years. So that was uh, a significant investment. So I invited all my colleagues to come and measure a variable, a response variable. We had 43 in the end as part of that experiment. So I don't have time to show you too many of them. So um, at the end, just for the fun of it, we took the mesh off to look at whether it was reversible. Um, that's what it looked like after 15 days. And that's what it looked like after a month. And these enormous chunks out of the substrate, those are parrotfish grazing bites. That's by a species called Bulba metapong. Bulba metapong is, looks a bit like a London bus. It's, it's, uh, it gets to over a meter in length, and it's a very deep, uh, bump-headed parrotfish. Anyway, it's an impressive creature. And they tend to occur in schools of 30. So uh, an experimentally uh, provided kelp bed to them was just wonderful. Um, but they paid short shrift to it. And that's important in terms of those lock-in feedbacks that I described earlier. So it seems pretty clear from this experiment that even mature stands of macroalgae can be reversed if you happen to have an intact herbivore uh, uh, fauna on hand. OK. Um, this is what the macroalgal cover did. So I'll just show you a little bit of the data. This is macroalgal cover versus time. That peak was an early successional species, Podina, which was replaced later on by um, Sargassum. There's a lot of variability between our four replicate cages, and that's because occasionally a parrotfish would break in. And we would discover it four days later when we came along to maintain the experiment, by which time they destroyed half of the algae that had grown there. So we got a fair bit of variability. We kicked the parrotfish out any time we found them. And in the controls, there was comparatively very little algae. And that was what happened when we took away the, the mesh. This was the response by the corals that were recruiting in quite large numbers um, in the aftermath of the bleaching event. So in these two treatments, there's no difference. We got a lot of recruitment. It was suppressed by about 2 thirds in the full cages. What I haven't shown you here is the species composition of the recruits. So these were the normal reef crest coral assemblage that you'd expect, lots of acropores. This was a very altered, shade-loving, deep water coral recruit fauna that was quite different. So the trajectory of recovery of the coral fauna after the bleaching event in the, in the absence of fish or the presence of fish was completely different. We got a three-fold increase in coral cover in those two treatments and barely any increase uh, in the full cages. OK, so the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, who I had to beg for about two years to give me a permit to do this thing, when they saw the results, thought it was marvelous because um, it helped them to justify their recent rezoning uh, of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, because it showed that fish are important, not just from the perspective of managing stocks of targeted species, but also from the perspective of the ecological role that the different groups of fish play, particularly in this case, um, herbivorous fish. And so managing the drivers of flips, that is the biomass of herbivorous fish and also nutrient content, is one way of, of trying to prevent the phase shifts that have happened on many degraded reefs uh, around the world. So there's lots of people out there saying reefs are doomed and they'll all be dead in 30 years. Um, but I think that's not true. And there, are, while we're waiting for the world to get its act together in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, I think there are things we can do proactively that build resilience to climate change. I'm not saying we can climate-proof reefs. If we do get to four or six degrees extra heating, then they, I think they will cook, and they'll be very degraded. But I think if we can avoid dangerous climate change, and if we can locally manage water quality and fish stocks, then we can prevent regime shifts and have a somewhat altered and, yes, depauperate compared to the reefs we have now.
uh, reef assemblage, but we will still have functioning coral reefs uh, into the future if, if we address those issues. Okay, so the summary of the Great Barrier Reef is it's a very different system with uh, lots of species undertaking very similar ecological roles compared to the Caribbean. So we've got 35 species of three-dimensional corals, not just two in the Caribbean, and we've got a very diverse uh, herbivore guild. Um, however, the, the megafauna is rapidly declining. Uh, the reefs are moderately fished. The, the coral cover, there's evidence that it's slowly declining. And increasingly, the resilience of the barrier reef has been challenged by climate change, all of which demands new policy responses. So to wrap up, and I'll try and be quick, I just want to deal with some of the changes in management and governance that have occurred uh, in the last few years, which have been driven by the sort of scientific concepts and some of the data that, uh, that I've shown you during uh, this talk. So there, in general, there's been a scaling up of management efforts uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was set up in 1976 as a tailor-made agency created by an act of federal government whose sole job was to look after 2,000 kilometers of reef. That in itself, I think, was, was quite a groundbreaking thing to do a long time ago. Um, in this country, there's something called the US, task, US Coral Reef Task Force, which is a consortium of 38 agencies. Maybe it's only 37. Anyway, it's dysfunctional because no one's in charge. And those agencies have very different uh, cultures. People can argue with me over that, over a, a glass of wine or whatever. Um, so I think the governance structure in Australia is pretty good. Uh, there's, there's still room for improvement. Um, the management responses have been based on a, a very decent flow of information from scientists uh, to the management agencies. And there are various formal and in informal mechanisms that have been established to make sure that that happens. Learning from elsewhere has also been very important. And that's something that agencies are often reluctant to do. So they might have science from the next state, but it might not be applicable to their state. Or they might just want to ignore it. But in the case of coral reefs, this may sound crass, but the, the collapse of Jamaican coral reefs has been very important for the management of reefs globally. Because every coral reef manager worth their salt anywhere in the world knows that coral reefs can undergo unexpected regime shifts. And, and so that, that whole issue of losing resilience threshold behavior and unexpected crashes, is, is, is everyone's aware of that. And the other uh, innovative thing that the Marine Park Authority did is that they undertook some experiments. They did trials of no-take areas. And the scale of these was large. In fact, their permit was an act of federal parliament to temporarily rezone the Great Barrier Reef. They rezoned 12 reefs, and they had an experimental design with replication and controls where they open and closed reefs to fishing and measured the response of the reefs. And on that basis of a trial, they rezoned the entire um, Great Barrier Reef. So in 2004, rather, they rezoned the Great Barrier Reef and increased the amount of no-take area from 4.7% to 33. And the rationale was based around the resilience concept. It wasn't about protecting targeted fish stocks. It was about protecting ecological functional groups of fish and at building the resilience of reefs proactively in anticipation of future bleaching events that haven't yet occurred, which I think is quite innovative. They also, at the same time, instigated new fishing regulations for the remaining 66% of the reef where fishing still occurs. So on the same day as the rezoning occurred, bag limits were reduced, uh, new seasonal closures were established, and a, a list of species uh, were excluded from recreational and commercial fishing. And the final thing they did at the same time was launch a 10-year targeted water quality plan where they had to reach specific targets for phosphate, nitrate, and sediment loads by um, 2013. Okay. So that, that's a package of uh, policy responses to the, the trajectory um, that I uh, described earlier. And this is just a map uh, of, of the rezoning. Um, 
I, I don't know if you can see that, but prior to, uh, between 1976 and 2004, all the green zones were in the remote far north of the Great Marine Park, where nobody could protest about them being established in the first place. And uh, this, this is the new rezoning map. And this was a very sophisticated exercise that involved a, a huge scientific effort. Firstly, it involved mapping 77 habitat types right across the continental shelf. I have to remind you, I'm sorry, of the scale of this thing. So that's Australia. Australia is the same area as the United States, continental United States. If you take out Rhode Island, Australia's bigger. <laughs> okay. That's Queensland. It's the same size as Texas. And that's the Great Barrier Reef there. If that was uh, Los Angeles, then that would be the Canadian border. So it's big. And they mapped the whole damn thing, and they, they, um, they mapped 77 habitat types, not just the reefs. And so the, the objective of the uh, rezoning was to set aside at least 20% of each of those 77 habitat types as no-take area. The amount of actual reef which is now set aside as no-take is 45%. So it's, it's quite a radical um, rezoning. And the key issue here is that it had 90% public support. So it was passed by both the upper and lower house of federal parliament in Australia unanimously. It's a bit like, and the great advantage we have in Australia is the Great Barrier Reef is a national icon. It's a bit like the Statue of Liberty or something um, in this country. So the, the new legislation was a bit like strengthening wife beating legislation. You know, who's going to weaken it? Um, and so it, it, it just went through the parliament. I wrote a paper this year with two social scientists. It was published in July in PNAS about how the hell did this happen. So it's not a biology paper. It's about how an agency engaged with the scientists and used us, how it um, navigated the political morass, how it tricked its minister into doing good things. Um, it's not a paper that the agency could have written, and it's not a paper that I, a biologist, could have written on my own, but it's about how the agency navigated the transition to ecosystem-based management, and it's written by me with two social scientists. So if you want to know how they did this, um, I, I steer you towards that paper. Okay. Um, I could stop there, or I've got four more s slides, so what do people want to do? Okay. Um, all right. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'll, I'll be as quick. Um, I, I want to draw four lessons or recommendations um, from those um, two case studies. If anyone needs to leave to catch the 520 bus, I won't be insulted. Um, so the, the, the first one, and this is somewhat of a Western country luxury, I think, is to have more and bigger no-take areas. And I think the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority have set something of an international benchmark for developed countries um, in, in what can be achieved. Um, very briefly, the Western Australian government has another iconic Australian reef called Ningaloo Reef, and they asked me to give a, a Western Australia parliamentary briefing after the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef, and they got 33.7%. They're very proud of their 0.7%. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I think the argument needs to be made that these no-take areas are not about managing targeted species. They're about managing uh, the resilience uh, of ecosystems. 20 to 30% seems like a reasonable target. And that's not really a target that I can justify biologically. I think that's a target that it can be set by what the public are willing to support because public support for these things um, is absolutely uh, crucial. And developing countries, I think, need aid to help uh, establish um, these no-take areas. But I want to make a, a very specific point that no-take areas are not a panacea. Um, there's a lot of hype about them, and I think it's been somewhat oversold, and that's a fairly heretical statement to make, so I expect to be stoned afterwards. Um, we hear a lot of people talking about the benefits of no-take area for the surrounding seascape. So the idea is they provide a spatial refuge for targeted species which grow bigger and are more fecund and which export lots of larvae to the fished parts of the seascape. Wonderful. 
But what people tend to forget is that recruitment is a two-way process. So there's recruitment into the no-take areas as well. So the success of no-take areas is almost always attributable to the influx of recruitment into them, which overwhelmingly comes from the surrounding seascape where human activities proceed. So we can't just protect a network of no-take areas that will, that will connect to each other and fly over an increasingly de degraded seascape and, and, and survive in perpetuity. I think that's very naive biologically because of the connectivities that occur between the seascape and the no-take areas. So we've got to co-manage networks of no-take areas and the surrounding landscape who are about 250 million people in developing countries in the tropical world depend on, on their livelihoods. So the second point is for improved management of the rest of uh, the seascape um, for both no-take areas and non-no-take areas and for aimed at preserving connectivity and stock recruitment relationships. We tend to focus on connectivity of, if I can use the term, good larvae, larvae of things we want to see dispersing, but there's also connectivity of things we wouldn't want to see dispersing, like disease, um, algal spores, um, and so on. So the spread of diadema was a connectivity issue. So is the spread of crown of thorns, larvae, and, and, and coral uh, diseases. And at some point, if enough individual parts of the seascape flip, we may actually get a higher level threshold where even the remaining good places can be pulled down because of that bad connectivity. And I think that may be beginning now in parts of the Caribbean that until now have been well managed locally and are in much better shape, but even they are showing signs of degradation because of the spread of coral disease and, and other bad things from the rest of the seascape. A third issue has to do with governance arrangements and, and really the coral reef crisis is a crisis of governance. We either have non-functional institutions or non-existent institutions and so there's a huge research agenda that needs to be undertaken, not by people like me but by social scientists and anthropologists and people who know about institutional uh, arrangements and, and, and policy development. Um, it's clear from the Great Barrier Reef and from other places that if you don't have public support for things like no-take areas, they will fail. And the world is littered with paper parks, so-called. Most of the no-take areas that are being established globally today, about a thousand every year, fail. They fail as soon as the, uh, the NGO person, usually a 22-year-old from uh, Australia or America, gets back on the plane because there isn't a local buy-in uh, by, by people to maintain it. Um, by proactive, I mean uh, providing incentives to people for protection of functional groups before those stocks collapse, because one of the critical take-home messages of a resilience approach is that putting the genie back in the bottle is much harder than preventing that collapse uh, in the first place. So if we can put things in place in anticipation rather than reactively, we're, we're ahead of the game. And a, just an example of, of a flexible approach is, is to have um, seasonal uh, closures. And the final point I'd like to make is for an economic approach to the governance of coral So I think this is a very under-explored um, issue. Um, two years ago, I wrote a, a science policy forum about roving bandits. Roving bandits is not a term that will be fam familiar to the ecologists in the room, but the political scientists will know what it means. It refers to um, the advantage to you, if you're a hapless serf, of being subject to the whim of a local despot compared to hordes of roving bandits. The despot, because he has an attachment to place, will look after you because you're producing wealth for him. But the roving bandit will kill and maim and burn your crop rape your wife and you, and go on. So th this idea has, is now being applied to highly mobile fisheries like the shark finning fishery and the live fish trade, which is having huge impacts on tropical reefs around the world. These are highly mobile fisheries that have no attachment to place. They're generally either illegal or they're legal by virtue of the absence of any regulation that deals with outsiders coming in, 
paying an absolute fortune for the local stock, depleting it to ecological extinction, and then uh, moving on. So what are the inf inferences of all of that for, uh, for governance? Well, one, one approach is to provide economic incentives to people to, uh, to protect herbivorous fish, so tax herbivorous fish so that they cost a lot more than they currently do uh, on the marketplace, or developing regulatory uh, feedbacks between uh, the market and uh, the ecosystem. So CITES laws is one example, but they're um, a very slow and, and, and cumbersome uh, set of approaches. And the ultimate aim of all of this is to secure future options for poor people in developing uh, countries. So my, my take home thought for the day is that preserving reefs isn't just about the marine equivalent of koala bears. It's not just a, a conservation agenda about uh, preserving biodiversity. Yes, coral reefs are incredibly um, beautiful places and they're worth preserving purely for their aesthetic value, but that's a very Western approach to life that, that we can all relate to. But in the developing world, it's a social imperative. It's about food security, um, and it's also a moral imperative for us to help out. Thank you very much. a little bit, but not much. Um, uh, there's a handful of papers, but, but, but no. And even the species composition shift that I described has not been very well documented. So it's not that it, it just hasn't been documented. We don't know if it's happening very well. Correct. Is it very subtle? Yeah, there's some evidence that the genotype of the zooxanthellae has shifted. Uh, so when corals bleach, they usually regrow their depleted zooxanthellae population from the depleted population that's still in the bleached colony. Or they take up the same strain from the, the water column. Um, there are a few instances of a, sh of a shift. And so people have used the term adaptive bleaching, the idea being that there's widespread shifting, but there isn't any evidence for that. I, I don't really think the term adaptive bleaching is appropriate since there's up to a 95% mortality after a severe bleaching event. Now, that's not really adaptive. Okay. So, to what degree do you think that initial trajectory from, say, you know, the coral state to the macroalgal state is different, of course, than the return state, maybe due to a different list or a different ranking of stressors? I mean, a couple of decades ago, we were all concerned about crown of thorns and running around and gathering them up in bags, concerned about uh, Clorox killing a coral reef has local processes. To what degree do you think the sort of shifting of stressors is responsible for, say, the different trajectories from one state to the other? Yeah, I can't answer that definitively, but you're absolutely right. So that, that graph I showed intermediately where there were multiple states, the inference of that is depending on what, what set of stressors you're returning to, you'll get a different outcome. How big a threat is uh, ocean acidification? I think the jury's still out on that. It's a longer term threat. Um, as you know, a lot of CO2 has been absorbed by the ocean and it's driven the, the, the pH um, by about 0.1 uh, levels so far. Um, the, the reason I'm hesitating is that there's various strands of evidence. So there's, there's a whole set of modeling studies that look at contours of carbonate uh, in the ocean through time. And they all show um, a decrease in, in the saturation level and a, a, a constriction of the zone where calcification is likely to, to occur. Um, we have a pretty rudimentary understanding though of how calcification in corals proceeds at, at different carbonate levels. Uh, 
the existing evidence is based on short-term experiments that are, can be criticized for lacking e ecological uh, realism. There's an analogous set of experiments where people have subjected corals to huge shifts in temperature, so, which I call cooking experiments, um, where you take a coral, put it in from its ambient temperature of, say, 28, put it in 36 degree water. And it doesn't surprise me that if you do that in a time frame of five minutes, that two weeks later it'll be dead. Um, there are analogous experiments underway with, cal with changing pH, and there are other ones where people are simultaneously changing both. The challenge is to do that in such a way that, it's, um, that you're not just shocking um, the organism. So I, I, I know of one study being done by one of, one of our postdoctoral fellows, Phil Monday, where he's rearing three generations of reef fish over the next five years. He's just starting on generation two in a, in a set of thermal and, and pH conditions um, that I think are a reasonable range. So he's not looking at a, you know, 2,000 parts of per million of CO2 or 42 degrees centigrade. He's got reasonable gradation of those two variables, but he's measuring things like heritability and selection pressure. So he's looking at the evolutionary response. The, the key issue for coral reefs is to what extent can they either migrate or genetically adapt over a 30 to 50 year time frame? And we just don't know the answer to that question. There's, there's evidence of local adaptation to the exist, uh, existing thermal range within the geographic boundaries of individual species, which are quite huge. So there's a shared coral fauna between the coolest reefs and the warmest reefs. The Persian Gulf fauna has 54 species of corals. They bleach at about 36 degrees centigrade. Those same species are found in the southern part of the Pacific Ocean and at places intermediate. So they're definitely the same species. And they bleach it at a temperature which is 10 degrees cooler. So that, that tells us that there's local adaptation along the length of the Great Barrier Reef. There's a five degree centigrade difference at any particular time of, of year. Corals tend to bleach when the water gets about two degrees above what they're used to at the summer maximum at that location. So it's a relative threshold, not an absolute threshold, which infers that there's local adaptation to the climate regime at that place. We have no idea how long that takes or about the dynamics of how it's maintained in the face of gene flow of warm adapted or cold adapted genotypes dispersing among locations. So we're already seeing evidence for polar expansion of coral reef species. We're starting to see tropical fish in Sydney Harbour now overwintering, which has never been observed before. We're seeing corals and reef fish jumping along the island hopping along the Ryukus chain towards southern Japan and we're starting to see it in the, in the Caribbean, North and South Carolina are now getting more frequent records of, of Caribbean species. So they're, they're, they're certainly responding as indeed are lots of other um, ecosystems. So I guess my point is I don't think it'll all be dead in 30 years. And uh, I, I, th I think the message shouldn't be reefs are screwed and, and we shouldn't just give up on them. So we have to cut this off, but let me just tell you that uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, after 2.30, uh, Terry has time up with, through 4.30 for individual meetings, and if you want to come as a group of people, there's a, enough room to do that, so just contact myself or Kathy Merck and set up a time and, and, and come on over. Let's thank Terry again. Thank you.